Thank you very much. Um, okay, just to give a quick summary of what we did last time, uh, we revisited why we have bosons and fermions as the only options in 3D and what happens when we restrict to 2D. Um, and then we had a look at the implications of this more general phase and mutual statistics that we could have in two dimensions and this led to the concept of non-trivial fusion and braiding, and I introduced the, the Fibonacci anions as a specific example. So today what I want to do is I want to build up a model for these anions, which is uh, called TQFT, and we're going to build this up in stages, first by introducing uh, like anion labels, add in the idea of fusion, then we're going to have to introduce some kind of consistency add in the braiding, and then we'll have our model and start computing topological invariants. Okay. Right, so the, the mathematical framework for these anion models that we're talking about uh, are called topological quantum field theories. The way I see TQFTs is kind of a coverall uh, word or set of words for methods of computing topological invariants, essentially. More precisely, I guess, uh, the mathematical models that we're going to be using uh, are typically called unitary modular tensor categories, which sounds very scary. And you'll also see a lot of other scary words that crop up in the literature, such as braided, monoidal, ribbon, spherical, pivotal, all of these horrible sounding complicated words. And what I want to do a bit today is to demystify this. It doesn't need to sound so scary. Um, we're just going to build up this anion model and think of this more in terms of particles and uh, stuff we're comfortable with. OK. So to start with our model of anions, we need anions. So first, we construct a set of essentially the labels for the particles that are going to be in our model. Uh, these are sometimes referred to as the topological charges or the topological uh, sectors of the model. So this is literally just a set of letters, of labels. And this will always include this uh, one, this identity, this vacuum, and then a set of other anions. Now, what I'm going to do throughout is rather than writing just equations, we're going to start drawing diagrams. Uh, for this model, um, and this is a lot like Feynman diagrams. We can think of these as particles that live in 2D, and we have uh, like a, a time direction going up here, and what I've drawn is essentially an anion sitting still, but it's going forward in time with label A, and similar to Feynman diagrams, I can think of an antiparticle for an anti-anion as a particle going backwards in time. And I can also uh, draw um, in these identities if I need to. They're really just a vacuum, but if I want to, I might want to draw a dashed uh, line for these identities. OK, so yeah, some conditions. We need that there is always this unique identity element in our set of uh, anions, and this is the vacuum. Um, and then there's always a unique anti-anion for every anion. OK? Now, sorry. No, that's a good point. So um, these arrows, so let me say this next point, an anion can be its own inverse. And that means that it going back in time is the same as it going forward in time, and so this arrow has no meaning then. An example of such an anion is the vacuum, and so this arrow for the identity doesn't really make sense. You're exactly right. Okay. Um, so in that case, A is equal to A bar, and we've already seen an example of this. Um, all of the anions we've seen so far actually are their own antiparticle, including the Fibonacci anion. Great, so we've got a list. We've got a set of uh, labels. The next thing we need to do is introduce uh, fusion. So now I'm going to define things a bit more generally. We can write down um, this fusion equation, which says A fuses with B, 
and now we get this um, sum of possible outcomes. So this, we have this C with these, uh, sum over this C with these uh, numbers, these integers which are uh, called the fusion multiplicities. Okay, so the simplest example of this would just be A cross B is equal to C for some unique anion, but we, as we saw last time, we're allowed mut um, multiple fusion channels in the general non-Abelian case. So some examples. Um, first is the easing anion. So this is one that I mentioned very briefly after a question yesterday. Here we have three anions, the identity, a Majorana, and the fermion. And here are the non-trivial uh, fusion rules for this model. Okay, so we always have that fusion with the identity is trivial, just gives about the same particle. Um, we have that the Majorana fermion is its own antiparticle, which means that the identity is one of its fusion channels. But in this case, this model turns out to be non-Arbelian, and so uh, the fusion of two Majoranas also has the fermion as one of its channels. Um, okay, and then we have the other, the other um, fusion rules as follows, so the fermion is also its own inverse. Can I just add the vacuum anion to like, any of these equations? I mean, add? Like, I mean, adding the vacuum is, is uh, doing nothing? Like, yeah, so in any model, we always have that one fused with the, uh, the anion is just the anion itself. The anion itself could also be the identity. I think that's all of the trivial ones that would come from. Like for the rightmost fusion rule, could I just, uh, on the right hand side of the equation, or could I just put like a plus one with this change? No, that, that would, that's not, um, so the plus side, that's not trivial, having a plus identity. So okay. here, this, this um, when you have a unique fusion channel, this is really like a group uh, multiplication now, right? So you have two operators multiply give you another element in your set. Um, this one plus um, is a bit different. I'll explain in a minute what this means, this, this plus, the two options for the fusion channels. Okay, so coming back to our example that we're gonna keep coming back to, uh, Fibonacci anions, the non-trivial rules are as follows. We have that the tau is its own inverse, and it's also non-abelian, we have that uh, these two channels for the fusion of two tau's. Okay, so one thing I should say is that uh, these fusion multiplicities are non-negative integers, and in particular, it is possible for them to be greater than one. Now, this confuses things, it makes things more complicated, we have to carry around extra indices, do more bookkeeping, um, and more importantly, these are very rarely considered. Okay, so it's very rare that a physical model or anything we care about will have greater multiplicity, so we're going to forget about it. Okay? Um, but again, this, this idea that you can have a multiplicity greater than one is not so far, and this also comes up in like, the composition of groups as well. But we're, we're just going to forget about that, and NABC, these fusion multiplicities, will only be zero or one, whereas, as far as we're concerned. Okay, um, so very quickly let me comment on the quantum dimension. So this is something that crops up yesterday, again, very, very briefly, um, when I'm talking about the Fibonacci anions, I said that these control essentially the growth of the Hilbert space when we add more and more anions. Um, we can actually um, introduce these essentially as eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this um, these fusion multiplicities. We can think of this NABC as a matrix and these uh, quantum dimensions, which I think I'll talk about again later, but if I don't, you can ask me about it. Uh, these crop up as eigenvalues of, of this um, these fusion rules and you know maybe that's not so surprising then that as we add more and more anions, they're gonna control how many more options we have for the fusion of multiple anions um, and so how the Hilbert space will grow. Okay, so now, uh, you know, this is kind of a list of properties that um, this, this fusion must have. Most of them are really trivial and we're gonna kind of rush through them. First is that they're commutative. This is 
You know, if, if you use A and B, or if you use B and A, these are really the same thing. Like, just thinking about these particles, you know, it doesn't matter which way you put those. Um, it's also associative, so if we fuse A and B first and then fuse it with C, uh, we get the same thing as fusing B and C first and then fusing with A. Uh, also, the rule that I've said before, fusion with identity is trivial, and that the fusion with antionions, we always have this unique antionion for each particle. And what this means is that the identity is one of its channels, but it, you can allow multiple other channels. Okay. So um, now, you know, again, I've written an equation. What I want to do is write this down as a fusion diagram, so as diagrams for these, for these anions. So we can think of the fusion rules as a specifying ways that we're allowed to fuse two anions. Okay, so these two diagrams, we can think of, you know, we can separate them into fusion and splitting, but we're not too bothered about that. It's always, you know, three lines are essentially meeting in this space-time diagram, and what three lines are allowed to meet is specified by the fusion rules. Okay, so, you know, we can think of this going forward in time. A and B come together, and then this diagram uh, essentially reads that C is in the fusion channel of, of those two. So here I've actually reversed one of the lines, so uh, this B is going backwards in time, and so actually the rule here is A cross B bar is equal to C. Okay? Right. Um, yeah, and so the idea is that this diagram can appear if the fusion multiplicity is not zero. Okay. So you might be tempted to think, you know, these rules say, let's bring together A and B, and what's going to spit out are C plus D plus E. Like it's spitting out three things when I bring two particles together. That's not what the fusion rules mean. It's really a rule for if a diagram is allowed. Okay, so I can draw a diagram if these fusion and multiplicities are not zero. Okay. Um, so I, I introduced the picture last time with these loops saying that collectively two anions can behave like another anion. And this was another way of, of drawing these fusion diagrams that I'm now introducing. So one way of thinking about this is I've I'm kind of taking a snapshot of my system at a given point in time. And you kind of the top view of this is I have my three anions, A, B, and C. And collectively, A and B are in fusion channel D. And all three of them are in fusion, panel, uh, fusion channel E. Okay, so this left fusion diagram really is the same as this, this on the right. Okay, so let's go for some examples. Let's look at the the allowed states for two anions and three anions, and we can go further than that. So for two Fibonacci anions, there are two possibilities. Okay, so we have two Fibonacci anions, there were two channels, one and tau, and what that means is that one is an allowed channel and two is an allowed channel. Okay, so those two states are allowed states, and this forms our Hilbert space for um, two anions. Now for three Fibonacci anions, we get the states that I introduced last time, but are now in the slightly different notation of these fusion diagrams. And one thing you might notice is that we don't have this kind of uh, two to the power n that you would imagine if I had like a spin half degree of freedom. I'm allowed a one or a tau in each position. It's not as simple as, you know, add more particles, it just doubles your Hilbert space now. We have a more complicated relationship based on what's allowed at each of these vertices. Um, so yeah, in these notes today, I'm going to give a few exercises that are quite useful to just go through because you know, I can say these things, it might make sense, but just doing a very quick calculation is very helpful. And I can share these notes online as well. Um, so for these Fibonacci anions, if you keep doing this sequence, you can show that the number of allowed states actually is the, uh, given by the Fibonacci sequence. Okay? So hence... Hence the name. Uh, it's quite easy to show, so I encourage you to try to do that. Um, and there we get exactly that this, this idea that the quantum dimension controls the growth of the Hilbert space. You know, these, uh, this Fibonacci sequence 
uh, grows exponentially, but um, exponentially, you know, it's the golden ratio to the power n. Okay. And another exercise, you know, this is for Fibonacci anions. I gave you the rules for easing anions, uh, so you can also um, play this game and write down what are the allowed states for three, four Majorana fermions. Okay, are there any questions at that point? Okay. Okay, so now we know, we've got the anions, we've got these uh, fusion rules, so we know like what diagrams we're allowed to draw. But when we have more than two anions, things start to get a bit ambiguous because we can fuse things in different orders. Okay, so if I have three anions A, B, and C, then there's two ways that I could have uh, drawn this fusion diagram. I could have A and B fusing to E and then fuse with C to get D. But alternatively, I could have chosen to fuse B and C first and then with A. Okay, so we know from associativity that the allowed fusion rules are the same, so like the allowed D should be the same on both sides. But as states, these, these two things um, are different. So I wrote up here that the three allowed states for Fibonacci are these. So I was using this convention that we always do like left to right fusion. So then the question is, what does this mean? Okay, if they're my three allowed states, how do I write this in terms of my three allowed states that I wrote down with the other convention? Now these are two equally valid choices, right? We can do this, but what we need is um, an additional ingredient. We need a way of relating those two choices. At the moment, we don't have, have that information to relate those two, so that's something we have to add to the theory. Um, and the way to do this is by adding something called the F moves. And these are just a relationship between, you know, this, these three anions, uh, fused in this order, and these three anions fused in that order. Um, and these F moves, you know, they have symbols depending on the anions, basically the top of the picture and the bottom of the picture. Then we have these matrix indices that depend on the anion, uh, you know, the intermediate anion that's included in the fusion. Uh, and this, this is a unitary matrix. Uh, yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe we can wait for the microphone. <laughs> Yeah. In, instead of, you know, like moving the brackets, I could also do, uh, like, exchange the anions, right? But then this would not be the same because I get, like, a phase factor for the. So, how can it be both? Or? So, so, at the moment, I have not introduced the idea that we can swap them. So, that is an ingredient that I will have to add. At the moment, all we have is the anions, they're fixed, and all I can do is I can fuse them in different orders. Oh, okay. So we're gonna have to build up this theory, and when I add in this idea that you can swap them, we'll see what happens and see if we have to add any more constraints or any more relations into okay. the theory. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. okay, any other questions about that? Okay. Um, Great, so now, um, yeah, there's certain rules that are trivial. Basically, if um, any of A, B, and C is uh, one, then we just end up back with this, you know, three particles fusing at a point, and so this, this is trivial. Um, okay, so now that our fusion, we have it, it, it contains both these fusion multiplicities and this way of relating these different diagrams. Okay, so the logical thing to do is we start with two anions fusing, then we did three anions fusing. We had to introduce some extra um, relations between them. Now let's consider what happens when we uh, look at four anions. Uh, and if this is scaring you, don't worry, it does end at four. So, <laughs> so uh, we won't have to go much further than this. So when we have four, again, there's different ways that we could uh, choose to fuse these, like different orderings for fusing. So the way you should read this diagram is I start at the left and I end up at this guy on the right. Now the first way I could do this is I could use the F moves to change the diagrams in this way. Okay, so what I'm doing here is essentially 
I look at this little block down here with C, D, and G, and I use the F move for that one first to get this L coming up, and then I do it with this B, L, and F to get this K coming up. But I could have done it a different way. I could have gone along this bottom route when I do it in a slightly different order. And because I'm going from one side to the other, these really should um, be the same thing. It shouldn't matter which way around I do it. And so we have uh, a consistency equation, which is called the Pentagon equation. And the reason it's called the Pentagon, Pentagon equation is because I have drawn the pentagram with these diagrams. Um, so now this is a consistency relation. Um, the fusion is only allowed if the F moves satisfy this, this equation. Yeah, so now you might ask, what about five? What about six? And thankfully, uh, this is enough. Okay, so now we've got the F moves and we've got this pentagon equation. Uh, that's, that works for all higher orders. Everything else is now not ambiguous. Fusion now is fixed. Fusion now works. Okay. So again, we have an example. You know, this is, you've got these F moves with loads of indices. We've got this uh, equation. So it's helpful, again, to do something concrete. You can actually solve the pentagon equation for the Fibonacci anions. Okay, so I've given you the fusion rules for the anions. Now all you need to do is look for essentially the remaining non-trivial ones um, from this equation. Okay, so I can give you these exercises and give it a go, and you can find out that you, you end up with, uh, with these solutions. There's only one solution to the equation in this case. Right, so I, I said I was going to try like demystify some of these um, you know, terms that crop up in this field. So what we have at the moment is uh, what's called a tensor category or a monoidal category. Uh, yeah, essentially what we have now is these anions with uh, consistent fusion. Okay, so that's, that's where we are so far. Okay, so the next ingredient we want to have this uh, model of the anions is to allow us to start swapping them, to start doing this braiding, uh, which is where the interesting stuff is. So again, this is an ingredient we have to add. We have to allow diagrams where we have uh, swapped anions A and B. And so we end up with diagrams now that have this uh, crossing. Okay, so this is like a right-handed twist of this A and B. And now we define this to be uh, equal to these R moves times the untwisted diagram. Okay, so again, the idea is we introduce a diagram that is not part of our vocabulary, and we introduce a way to relate this back to the diagrams that, that are part of our vocabulary. Okay. And now R is just, uh, it's not a matrix, it's a complex phase that depends on, on those three anions. Right, so, you know, again, to get these pictures maybe a bit better in your head, uh, you know, I'm always drawing these in 2D, but really you should think of these like as 3D. We have a direction that's coming out of the board. So when I draw these, I'm doing it in the side view. So I have time going up. I have space like going sideways, and I also have this idea now that I can bring an anion sort of out of the page and around another one. But on the top view, this is really the kind of braiding that I was talking about last time that we, we take to and we swap their positions. Right, so yeah, this RAB is just now a complex phase, so it's, it's unitary, but it's just a phase. Um, and again, if we have the identity, then this, this guy is trivial. Okay, so now, just as for the F moves, you know, we play this game, like if we start twisting things um, for more anions, there are different ways that we can do this, and we end up at another consistency equation called the hexagon equation. Okay, so again, the way to read this is maybe a bit big. You know, we start at the left, and we want to kind of undo this braid, so we've dragged A across the other two, we want to undo this and get this back to like one of our fusion diagrams that we're happy with. 
And there's two ways of doing this. We can either apply an R move first, followed by an F, followed by an R to get over here. Or we can do it another way using F move, then R, then F. Okay. And again, for this braiding to be defined consistently, um, the R moves now have to satisfy what's called the hexagon equation. Um, now, it turns out there are actually two hexagon equations. There's a hexagon equation for the uh, conjugate as well. So there's actually a pair of, a pair of these. Yeah, question. Uh, you always start with a single anion. Is it uh, for reasons? Like, can't I start with two of them? And then I can have braid without sword leg? Yeah, so you can have diagrams with numbers of legs at the top, numbers of legs at the bottom. In the end, really, what we're going to do is we're going to be computing closed diagrams, so there's no legs left over. Okay, so these diagrams are usually going to be like sub-diagrams of what we care about. Now, we can think of these, it's simpler to think of these having like one final leg at the bottom, and really the way I would think about this is um, kind of this top-down picture that I, that I drew here, that we have, you know, we're sitting at the top at time uh, T, where we have A, B, and C, and these fusion channels kind of tell us the history of how they came about. Like it started as an E, it split into to D and C, and then it split into to A and B. So that's one way that you can think about this. Okay. Okay, so yes, thankfully, again, uh, this is enough. Okay, so now we've introduced the R moves, we have this consistency equation, and uh, that's enough. We don't need to go to a higher number of anions to see if um, you know, there's anything else that would crop up that's inconsistent. There's a theorem that says that now everything is settled. Okay, now these equations are generally very difficult, and there is no known general solution to these equations. And what that means is that TQFTs, or topologically ordered systems, are not classified. There is no general classification of topologically ordered systems. There are people who have basically done this by brute force up to, um, I think, like five anion types or something like this, where they have really gone through um, like the options and classified those. And there are, you know, special examples that get quite complicated with more anions, but generally uh, these, these equations do not have, have a general solution that we know about. Okay. So again, you know, everything starts to look me messy. We've got all of these indices. We've got these consistency equations. It's starting to look a bit complicated and maybe a bit scary. Uh, so I encourage you to just try solve these uh, equations. We're just talking, you know, two by two matrices. Um, so try this for the Fibonacci anions. Now, in this case, I've given you a bit of a hint. Um, try to solve this hexagon equation when A, B, C, and D are equal to tau. So there's several different equations here. So I say it's an, an equation, but there are actually many equations in here depending on the what, what um, indices you have on both sides. So try solve it for those um, values, and what you'll find in this case is that we have two solutions, and these are related by complex conjugation. Okay, so we can kind of think there's a, a right-handed tau anion, but there's also a, a, a conjugate theory, which is essentially the same theory, but um, yeah, it's kind of like a left-handed version. Okay. So now what we have is um, a modular tensor category or a braided monoidal category. Again, all of these words coming up, it doesn't really matter. What we have now is our anion model with fusion and braiding. Okay. Maybe just one comment, this, this word modular has come up. And uh, I mentioned last time that the statistics can be um, summarized by the S and the T matrix. Now, you might have wondered why S and T are used, and this really comes from uh, uh, them being representations of the modular group. Okay, so now this, we've got a connection between braiding, these R moves, and the modular group, and this is where S and T come from. 
Right, so that's kind of the model now. We have pretty much everything in there. So now let's start doing, doing things. Let's look at more general braids. Um, OK, so with these F and R moves, we can look at a braid process where we have uh, anions C, and B, and C, which could be you know, part of a system with many more anions. So I've, I've drawn these dotted lines off here. And now what I'm doing is I'm going to swap this B and C, so we end up with a diagram with this crossing. And now this is defined as this uh, B operator here, but this is not now something I'm adding in. I can now write this down in terms of the F and R moves that I defined. Okay, and then we can, uh, we can show, again, it might be a good exercise that using the F moves and the R moves, you can decompose this, this diagram here into this one. And what you get is uh, this combination of F and R moves. Okay. So let's now consider fi the Fibonacci anion example. And I promised last time that these matrices that I just threw at you and said, look, we get these matrices when we braid. Now we're going to show that you know, we've constructed this model, we've added these ingredients, and now we actually find we can compute uh, these matrices. So in this different notation now, we can draw these braid operations, this A and B that I wrote last time. The first one, um, this uh, looks like this, so we twist the first two. And the second braid looks like this, where we've uh, swapped the second two. Now, just by looking at them, we know what these are, right? So this, this first one, this is really given just by this um, R move, right? So this is just, if we just ignore the bottom part, we just focus on this. We know how to undo this. This is just the definition of the R moves. And this diagram on the right, this is just the definition that we just introduced of these braid operators. Okay? So now what we can do, we've solved the, hex, we've solved the pentagon equation. We've got these F moves. We've solved the... Um, hexagon equation, we've got these R moves. Now all we need to do is plug them in um, to these expressions and we can get these matrices. So an exercise then is to show that the A process is given by these R moves. Okay, and hopefully this one you can just kind of read off from this diagram. Okay, you know, the, what would happen for the different possibilities for A and B. And we can also do uh, this uh, B process, which gives us uh, this matrix. Okay, so these, these phases are coming up from the R moves, and these golden ratios are coming up from, from the F moves. And if you do want to try this, uh, you probably are going to need some relations for uh, the golden ratio, some of which you probably know. So you probably know these uh, top ones. Right, so... This equation at the end is essentially the definition, the equation. The golden ratio is the solution of this equation. Um, but these bottom ones you might not have seen before. That these, these uh, phases that I've introduced, even though they look like rational phases, they've got like 4 pi over 5, again, magically, the golden ratio pops up. And you're going to need that to, to solve this. OK. Are there any questions at that point? OK. Um, right, so now let's compute some uh, topological invariants. So now we're going to actually compute this S and T matrix. So you might see this. It's all quite backwards from what I did last time. Like this S and T is really the physical object. This is the, the phases that we get from exchanging and swapping particles. And now what I've done is I've built up this model from scratch with these anions, added all the ingredients that I need to get these processes that I want. And now we're going to actually compute these, these measurable topological invariants. OK. So let's start with the topological spin. So this is the exchange statistics. Now this is defined as this diagram. OK. So you know, we'll take that as a definition of, of this topological spin, but now we can actually kind of see what this corresponds to physically, and this will match up with our expectation of exchange. 
Okay, so this definition, it has this uh, weird, um, you know, twisted, twisted loop. And the way to interpret this diagram is by taking like the top view and looking at slices in time as we go up this diagram. So to begin with, at this blue line, what we have done is we've created two anion anti anion pairs. Okay? Then what we've done in, the, in between is we swap the middle two. So we swap the A and the A. So now if we ignore the, the other an anions in the system, this is really just the exchange of A with A. And then finally what we do is we annihilate again uh, the remaining anions and anti anions. Okay. So, you know, time, time is always quite, you know, fluid in these diagrams, but the way I would think about these is that time is going up. And then what I have drawn here is, uh, you know, time snapshots at the bottom. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this quantity, uh, this topological spin, contains the exchange statistics for the anion, right? So we know for bosons, we're going to get uh, plus one. For fermions, we get minus one. And for general anions, what we're going to get are these complex phases. Uh, and again, just a comment, you know, all these words crop up. You might see the words conformal scaling dimension. Again, this is another word that crops up when talking about this topological spin. Okay, so we now actually have the machinery, except some details, which I'll quickly flash over, to compute this guy. Okay, so we have the F and the R moves, so now we can actually compute this diagram and this topological spin in terms of these F and R moves. Um, so there are some extra rules that I'm going to like flash up there. Yeah, again, kind of physical, so I just want to flash over them. I don't, I'm not getting you to a level where you know, I give you these diagrams and you can compute them. I just want you to understand if you see these kind of manipulations that you shouldn't be scared of them, um, that this is what's going on. Okay, so this is the diagram we want to compute. So the first thing we do is essentially um, insert a resolution of the identity. Okay, so this is basically if we have two anions going side by side, what I can do is I can uh, make them fuse to something and then split again. And if I sum over all of the possible channels, then this is uh, essentially a resolution of the identity. Okay, so that's the first trick that I've added here. Um, then we're in a position now to get rid of this, this loop here, this uh, crossing using the R moves. So that's what we do here. Um, then we can uh, essentially redraw this picture you know, by, use, by essentially dragging this A to the other side to get this picture. This is essentially just a redrawing. You know, there's some detail that means we're allowed to do this. Let's ignore it. Let's just uh, say that we're allowed to drag this from one side to the other. Um, then what we can do again is another redrawing. Okay, so this is like a smooth deformation. This is still topologically like the same diagram. So from here to here, this is really just redrawing. Then finally, we um, use an orthog orthogonality condition that this, um, oh, that this loop uh, vanishes. So this is essentially saying if we zoom out, if we keep zooming out, then we don't care that there's this bubble here. It's just essentially you know, a C going through a diagram, but there are some, some factors that crop up. Uh, again, these are details. Um, uh, yeah. So now we can remove this bubble and we end up with this circle here. Now this circle is what I drew earlier uh, for this quantum dimension. Somewhere, here we go. So this, this circle here, this loop, is the, is the definition of the quantum dimension. So now that's all we're left with. And so finally, we have an expression for the topological spins in terms of the R moves. And it turns out these quantum dimensions show up. OK, so now what you can do is take the R moves 
from the Fibonacci model and compute these. One question about the yeah. uh, Maybe you can just wait for the microphone. Thanks. Uh, I'm confused about this orthogonality relation. So you say like there C uh, splits into like A and A and then goes back again. So it should be like one of the possible processes that come up when you uh, put the resolution of the identity, right? Uh, but if it's the same as C again, then there's like only, this means there's only one process because it makes up the full identity. Well, no, right? so oh. it's not quite the same as this resolution of identity. Um, and yeah, the fact that there are possible other channels is essentially encoded by this um, prefactor here. So this is, the reason I've skipped over this is because I've not formulated these diagrams as you know, vectors in the Hilbert space. I'm trying to just talk about them as diagrams where you have anions. But really, you know, these, these fusion diagrams, I can define vector spaces, at ABC. This guy lives inside a vector space. And then I can define inner products, define orthogonality, and define the ideas of resolutions of identity. Okay. So the stuff that you need to understand this orthogonality and this identity, I have not talked about. Okay, so basically this loop is not a fusion process, more or less. Well, it is a fusion process, but I, you know, it involves stuff that I've not told you. So okay. you just have to, you know, there's extra stuff that, that comes along. You can define, because you have a vec space, you can define like norms and uh, orthogonality, and this is where, where this comes up. It turns out actually that there is degrees of freedom you don't have to have exactly these factors coming up. There is some choice of how you normalize things, but these factors will move somewhere else. Okay, um, so they're always there, but you have a lot of choice then where you put those factors. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah, there's another question. Okay, this question is maybe uh, a bit more general. Just, just as a, maybe just from my understanding, just in the end, basically the fundamental principle is just the definition is the fusion rule. So that's the one thing that is actually given. And from that, basically all the R moves and F moves kind of come from the self-consistency. So basically the only ingredients to have this whole theory consistent is just knowing the original fusion rules. Um, no, so the fusion rules are the starting point. The F and the R moves are the possible models for those fusion rules. Okay, so there are different anion models that are possible if you write, write down certain fusion rules. Okay. So one thing I said was from these S, this S matrix, you can actually go back and deduce the fusion rules. The other way around is not possible. There can be multiple different models that have the same fusion rules, but differ in the way that they, they braid. And what would this correspond to if I have the same fusion rules, but different models? Like, uh, would, because there's, is th there's an ambiguity there, and uh, how do you then choose if the ambiguity, how, how do you resolve this ambiguity? Well, it's not really an ambiguity. So the, um, the fusion rules really define your Hilbert space, mm -hmm. okay? And the F moves and the R moves, they define relationships between states and relationships between the manipulations of these states. Okay, so they, the F and the R moves really define your model. The fusion rules define like your Hilbert space. Okay. okay, okay, so you can have different models in the same Hilbert space, that's the idea. Yeah. Okay, it makes sense. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and again, really the idea is, you know, with, with fermions we had this minus sign and it had a lot of consequences. With anions we have this phase and it had a lot of consequences like this fusion and all of this kind of stuff. So now what we're trying to do is build up a, consist a consistent model that captures all of that. So we're really making the simplest thing. We start with the anions, we add the fusion, we make it as simple as possible just so it is consistent and we end up with these, these TQFTs. Great, so yeah, now you can just compute these things. This is a topological invariant from these R and the Fs. We can compute these topological spins. Okay, um, finally we can compute this uh, modular S matrix. So now comes the definition of this guy. So, yeah, there was a question last time about like what happens when you braid with the identity, and I wrote down this S matrix, and it had some 
you know, factors of the golden ratio that weren't, you would have thought there would be one. And this is where it really comes in. The definition of this S matrix is this closed loop configuration. Now we can think of it as close to this kind of uh, braiding process, but there are going to be some factors that relate the actual braiding with this, this diagram definition. Okay, so there is yeah, a step between those. Um, and there is a whole load of research basically in how you would extract these. So just like you have the churn number or whatever defined as some integral over the Brion zone, you know, how you actually compute that you know, is a different question. So it's similar here, we have this S matrix, it's some diagram. How do we actually compute that? We have to you know, cook up some, some way of doing this. Right, so now we have this diagram is linked, linked in this way. We have these two anions, A and B, and they're linked in uh, what's called a hot flink. Um, and again, let's do the same thing where we have snapshots in time and we can see exactly this process of dragging one anion around the other. So we create two pairs, anion, anti-anion pairs, but now of different species generally. Then we drag the A around the B and then again, we annihilate these. And this gives us exactly this, this linked diagram. So for example, we found in the Toric code that we had these E and M, which are bosons that have this non-trivial mutual statistics. And you might refer to these as mutual semions. Okay, so the final word that I want to add, you know, in this list of uh, jargon is uh, the unitary part. Okay, so for most physical theories, we impose that SAB is a unitary matrix. Okay, so there are models, if you just go through and uh, do this, you can cook up models where SAB is not a unitary matrix. And what we say is those models are not physical. Okay, so we impose that it's unitary um, as like, they're the physical models. And in this case, we have finally this unitary, which is the uh, condition on the S matrix, this modular, which is basically, this is the, the braiding part, the tensor, this is essentially the fusion part, and the category, well, this is just the, the mathematical model that we, that we have, really. So the underlying thing is a category, which is like a, a relaxed group. It's simpler than groups or algebras. Um, so there is a condition, so it does lead to something about, um, you can have degeneracy of states if you, of certain, there's certain degeneracies that come up if you have, if you don't have a unitary matrix, okay? So these degeneracies, um, you know, why these don't look physical, I can't remember, but there is a relationship between, uh, it being non-unitary and having like non-physical consequences in your theory. Is it more like an understanding or is there like a very strong reason why it cannot be physical? I'd have to look it up again. Like this is in a paper by Kateyev. He has like a paragraph on, on like why, why this should be unitary. Yeah. Okay, so now again, we can play some of the tricks, again, with this in like resolution of identity, but we're gonna be using these R and F moves. We're gonna compute this diagram. So we add in this resolution of identity. We undo these twists using R moves. We then redraw this diagram and get rid of all of these loops that we have in the diagram. And we finally end up with uh, an expression down here. Okay, so now this sum has, you know, it's a sum over C in the fusion in the allowed fusion channels of A and B. And I can actually rewrite this um, kind of like by adding a, a Kronika delta back in. I can put in this, um, these fusion multiplicities and sum over all C. Um, and now the reason to do this actually, it's important if, if these N, A, B, C are not just zero and one, this is actually important. As far as we're concerned, this is just like putting in the Kronika delta to write a sum over everything instead of a restricted sum. Okay, and then finally, yeah, there is a simplification. You can get rid of these R moves and write this actually just in terms of uh, the topological spins. 
Okay, and surprise, surprise, there's an exercise you can do for this. Just do it for the Fibonacci model or the easing model or whatever model that you like. Um, okay. So like, one final statement that I'm not gonna prove is something called the Verlinda relationship because, uh, sorry, is there a question? Uh, yeah. Um, so you said uh, diffusion rules themselves don't determine the R and F uh, moves because we have, still have some degree of freedom. Uh, but then starting from a certain action, say we have a, a, a part in theory with a certain quantum order, from that could we determine uh, R and F? Or how do we say, okay, this is the, what we have? Okay, so um, in many cases, S and T fully categorizes the model. So if you know S and T, in many cases, you can get back to R and F. Okay, so if you yeah, know the behavior of your anions in your model, you can go back to what the model is. However, this is not always the case. There are cases where you need extra topological invariance to be able to go backwards. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Okay, yeah. So you can go from like physical, physical quantities back to your model, which is so FNR. Could there be a physical model that doesn't have enough information in it to determine all of the topological data? I mean, do you specify a Hamiltonian and you have some ground state? Should, should that have all the information? In so manipulations of those. So if you have like all of the ground states, so say we're on the torus and you have degenerate ground states, yeah. manipulations of these, so actually, so yeah, then it depends. You would have to do more complicated things. So uh, essentially you would have to start doing processes that include more and more anions essentially. So the simplest ones were just S and T, you essentially only need two anions in your system to do something and from those invariants, you can go back. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes you need more complicated processes to fix down the theory. So you'd have to do a more complicated calculation. Yes. Uh, as far as I know, like, yeah, I don't, it could be possible that you need like an infinite number of uh, uh, topological invariants to go back. I don't know if that's ever the case. Um, and even more typically, S and T are enough. You, like, these theories very quickly get complicated and then they're also non-physical because you're just never going to see these complicated models. Uh, yeah. But again, this is part of the fact that these are not fully classified. We don't have a full characterization of these uh, topologically ordered systems. So the idea is for S and T, you only have to always just look for the combination of two anions, but in principle, that would not be enough and you have to look at the combination of more than two anions. Yes. Okay, so yeah, just a mention of this Valinda relation, just because uh, there is some really interesting maths behind this. There's uh, like the Valinda algebra that's all behind this, but I just mentioned this because this is the way that, given the S matrix, you can get back to the fusion rules. Okay, so with this this equation, um, yeah, even though like exchange statistics and mutual statistics sounds like completely unrelated to this fusion, they are related um, through this really nice uh, Valinda algebra. Okay, so now we're really at the end and I just want to give a summary, like a high level summary of, of what is TQFT and what we've done. So I think of this as like a series of inputs and outputs for the model. So our inputs are the anions that we have in, we have the fusion, so how they can combine and associated F moves. We have the braiding, so allowing us to move these anions apart. Um, yeah, so we have the anions. We have, essentially, this is defining our Hilbert space. And this is allowing to you know, move our anions about. OK, so now we have our model with all the parts. It's consistent, and it's consistent because of the pentagon and hexagon equation. And now what we get out are the physical quantities we care about. What happens when we start swapping them? What braids do we get? What are the exchange statistics, the mutual statistics? And I mentioned a couple of other things. There's a, something called the punctured S matrix, which is, can be quite important, and also something called the Frobenius Schur indicator. So these are instances of topological invariants that are not necessarily contained 
in the T and S matrix. Okay. So I think uh, pretty much out of time, so I just want to end with a shameless plug of some of my work uh, in this area that you might be interested in. Um, so the first is about the simulation of non-Abelian anions, uh, basically an algorithm for a type binding model, but not of fermions or bosons. Uh, where there's some code you can uh, play about with. I also mentioned the other day that there's some connections between complexity in these TQFTs. So we proved the theorem that um, certain S and T matrices imply an obstruction to Monte Carlo. And this is not just a local obstruction, this is really something that can't be removed by any local transformation. Um, and then related to uh, Pedram's talk earlier, we came up with circuits for the toric code, and we generalized this to a class of topological models called double, uh, called string net models, um, where we also worked out efficient circuits for how you could realize this on a uh, quantum computer. And with that, I will uh, finish. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the very good but slightly overwhelming <laughs> talk for me. But uh, <laughs> so, I mean, uh, you just mentioned it, but like, so so why again people, or I imagine these braids, you kind of like stabilize your, uh, or you, you can make stable qubits that are, or you want to use it for quantum computation, right? So like, where does it enter? Or what's the, how does it work? How do you, like with braiding, how do you make them stable? So yeah, the the point, the point of the stability is that uh, if you separate these anions far enough away, then we can uh, like uniquely define, you know, there's an anion here, and collectively they have this, this topological charge. And now local perturbations, essentially what they do is add very small loops like this. Okay? Uh-huh. So I could have my braid diagram. Let's go back to a braid. So when I'm doing my braid, essentially what I would get is some very tiny loops appearing. So these are like the local interference, uh, local perturbations from like noise or from something else, right? Okay. So as long as um, everything is separated on a longer, a larger length scale than these bubbles appear, then they're not going to affect the computation. Okay, but like for this to be true, it doesn't need to be an anion, right? I mean, you could also have like a like no, a stable so particle with a boring exchange. No, uh, so it does because uh, here the information really is in the global state. So the like what state we're in really depends on A and B. And now just adding a bubble here can never flip us between the zero and one state or the the one and the n state. Okay, you would need to have loads of bubbles that you know mess up this whole, uh, you know, this whole region here. Okay, so every, if everything's separated, local perturbations can never change what state we're in. However, if we have like local excitations or local operations, then they can they can be flipped by by local oh, okay. by local uh, perturbations. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I think it's about like uh, Feynman diagrams, but we are like putting faces to different channels in a sense. But the thing is like, I will repeat his question, I think, but to which extent using, for example, fermions and bosons or something that doesn't have this uh, different like weighting for each channel, could we uh, make the same calculations uh, beneath uh, or could be like less uh, robust, or it could be the same. Um, so I mean, you can have like fermions and bosons in these anion models, but the states you'll have are very boring. Okay, so if I have if I have two fermions coming together, then they have a unique output. 
Okay, so these abelian models, or so this is not generally true for fermions, but like typically if you just had like fermions in your model or you just had bosons, then all you have is the, bos the fermions and like the identity. So you'll always have just an identity here. Okay, so you won't have these complicated braids that allow you to do anything interesting. Okay. Okay. Um, but they are still protected. So this is why people use the toric code for memories. So there it's not, it is different to having just a free fermion in the system. You have essentially a non-local fermion or a non-local pair of fermions across your entire system. Okay, and the fact that this, this object has scale is where the uh, topological protection really comes from. Okay, so at the end, like, if we have fermions, we have a theory, for example, QCD, that we can interact them. And ah, okay. here, what we have at the end is like the fusion itself is a theory because the anions intermediate the pr physical processes. Or so, yeah, I wouldn't take this fusion, this uh, Fermi Feynman diagram picture, like, too literally. Like, these are not interactions. Okay. These, these, like, define the states, yeah. So okay. you can't take that too far. Thanks a lot. Um, so I was wondering how much of this analysis depends on the type of manifold that the anions live on. So for example, if your manifold is non-contractible or orientable or just one-dimensional, um, do you still get something like the hexagon and pentagon identities or do you get multiple vacuum states? Yeah, okay, so you know, this, is, this is getting more into like TQFT proper. Um, TQFT really describes ground states, okay? Ground states on different manifolds. And we can think of excitations essentially in a different picture where we have a ground state but with punctures, like with, uh, with uh, a different uh, yeah, genus, okay? But maybe just a simple answer is if I take my system on a torus, then I get a degenerate ground state. Now this degenerate ground state, the, the, the number of degen degenerate ground states is exactly the number of anions. Okay, so on the torus, this is literally, like the ground state degeneracy is literally the number of anions. Uh, more, more generally, we can have more complicated uh, surfaces. And these can actually be decomposed into uh, surfaces that look like this, that are often called uh, pants diagrams. I drew it the wrong way to call it a pants, but never mind. And these I can also label essentially with these fusion diagrams. So talking about ground states, you know, it's really the same story as I've talked about here in anions. Uh, yeah, I just don't want to go into detail of how they're connected, but they're really the, the same thing. Uh, the ground states are all degenerate, right? The ground states are, are, are degenerate, they? but the degeneracy depends on what manifold you're on. Yeah, uh, okay, and, and then like, let's say you have a flat plate that plane with really small holes so that there's maybe tunneling uh, through the holes, then do you still get the degeneracy and is this analysis still applicable? Because I think in some models like the toric code, you get like non-abelian particles if you cut small holes. Ah, uh, okay, so this is a different question. So that's really a combination of these anion models and the geometric um, deformation. Yeah. Okay, so just with these anion models, there's no reference to a lattice. So there you need an anion model plus a lattice. So yeah, I can't talk about that, what you're talking about here. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I think uh, we had a lot of discussion. Yes. Maybe a small question. Sure. When you talk about total obstruction in Monte Carlo, what do you mean exactly with total obstruction? Um, no, basically what we mean is uh, if you have a sign problem, then what this means is you're in the wrong basis, right? You're in a, there is always a basis that you can go to where your Monte Carlo is sign problem free. Now, what we proved is that uh, for these models, there is no local transformation that removes this sign problem. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you.